at Samuel chapter 7 this morning, and uh, we're going to pick up uh, the passage in about uh, verse, well, let's just begin at verse 1. We're going to be reading down through verse 17. Everybody there say amen. amen. Boy, that was weak as water. Is everybody there say amen? amen? That's a little better. And it came to pass. Now listen, I'm going to tell you this morning, you're going to need your Bible. We're going to be looking at a lot of Bible. I'm excited about this message. My body is tired, but my spirit's excited. And uh, we're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures, and I hope you'll turn with me and have your Bible ready to go. It's a wonderful thing to be sitting in the church, the Bible in your lap. Amen? Amen. You got a Bible, an old King James Bible in your lap. It came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. Man alive, that's still true today. This is a tabernacle. This whole body is a flesh. This, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Verse number seven, in all the places wherein I've walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, why build ye not in house of cedar? Verse number eight, now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, sheep coat from following the sheep. By the way, this, David is a picture of Christ in many, many ways in the Old Testament. He was a shepherd first. He took him from the sheep coat. Then it says in the latter part of that verse, from following the sheep to be a ruler over my people over Israel. He moved from being a shepherd to being a sovereign. There's a picture of Jesus Christ. The first time he came and today he is our good shepherd. But in the future, he'll be the chief shepherd. He'll be a king, a sovereign, king of kings and lord of lords in this earth. Verse number nine, and I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight. I have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in earth. Verse 10. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in the place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and caused thee to rest also from thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee in house. And when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. Now watch carefully. We're getting ready to enter into a very important passage of scripture. I will set up thy seed after thee which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, verse 12 starts in what's known in the Bible as the Davidic covenant. There are eight covenants in the Bible, and one of the most important covenants in the Bible is this covenant right here you're getting ready to read that God gave David. Covenants are important because God is a God who keeps his word. God makes promises. God makes agreements. God sets forth and lays out an order of things that, that he's going to do. Now, verse 13 says this, and he shall build an house for my name and I will, estab I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, did Nathan speak unto David. Now hold your place in 2 Samuel. Go to uh, Psalms 89. Psalms 89. We're going to read quite a bit of passage of scripture here. And then I'm going to try to preach quick, okay? Psalms chapter 89. We're going to begin at verse number 1. Psalms 89 is a reaffirmation of the covenant of David that God made. Covenants are important. How many in here saved this morning? Raise your hand. All right, you know what? Your basis of salvation is based on a covenant. It's based on a testimony of Jesus Christ. And if God's testament and God's covenant to you is no good, uh, you're in trouble and I'm in trouble. Covenants, testaments are very, very critical to our faith. Now, you can also read the covenant again in 1 Chronicles 17 verses, uh, I believe it's 4 through 15, but we're not going to go there. It's just a re it's a, another place. But I want to read Psalms 89 because it points out some of the great processes of this covenant and it makes you understand the basis of it here it takes off verse number one i will sing of the mercies of the lord god's covenant to david was based upon mercy he said forever with my mouth i will make known thy faithfulness to all generations god's covenant is based upon not only his mercy it is based upon his faithfulness 
God's covenant to you is based upon his mercy. The Bible said in Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. God is faithful. God's covenant is based upon his mercy. It's based upon, secondly, upon his faithfulness. Then he says in verse 2, For I have said, Mercy shall built, be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall be established in, very, in, shall, thou shalt establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn. There, look at that word. I have sworn unto David my servant. You can write your, what's he referring to? He's referring to 2 Samuel chapter 7. He said, thy seed will I establish forever, underline that forever, and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah, he said, Selah means stop and think about that. God is saying, David, I've made a covenant with you. He said, your seed is going to be established forever. I'm going to build up thy throne to all generations. The heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord likened to thee or to, thy, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Who's that talking about? Verse 9, thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Jesus Christ, that is a prophetic, Psalms is a book of prophecy. That is a prophetic reference. By the way, Jesus is the seed of David. When it talks about the seed of David forever, Jesus is the seed of David. You know that, I mean, if you know anything about the Bible. But this is a picture of Christ in the New Testament. Remember, he told the waves to be still. He stopped the raging sea. Verse 10, thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that has slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. The north and the south has created them. Tabor and Haman, Herman shall rejoice in thy name. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day. In thy righteousness they shall be exalted. For thou art the glory of our strength. And in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. For the Lord is our defense. The Holy One of Israel is our King. Then thou spakest in vision to the Holy One and saidest, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. Watch your Bible. I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established, mine arm shall be my arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness, now watch this, my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea, his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my father, my God, the rock of my salvation. Also I'll make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. And my covenant, listen to it, shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever. And his throne as the days of heaven. If his children, watch this now, watch this. Don't miss this. If his children forsake my law. Walk not in my judgments. If they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Watch verse 33. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. You better underline that in your Bible. Verse 34. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. You young people better write that verse down for your marriage ceremony. Verse 35. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. Verse 36. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Selah. Think about that. But verse 38. There's a change. Watch it. But thou hast cast off and abhorred. Thou hast been wroth with thine anointed. Thou hast made void the covenant of thy servant. Thou hast profaned his glory by casting it to the ground. Thou hast broken down all his hedges. Thou hast brought his strongholds to ruin. All that passed by the way spoil him is a reproach to his neighbors. Thou hast set up the right hand of, all, of his adversaries. Thou hast made all his enemies to rejoice. 
Thou hast also turned the edge of his sword and hast not made him to stand in the battle. Thou hast made his glory to cease and cast his throne down to the ground. The days of his youth hath thou shortened. Thou hast covered him with shame. Selah. How long, Lord, wilt thou hide thyself forever? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. Wherefore hast thou made all men in vain? What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Selah. Lord, where are thy former loving kindnesses, which thou swearest unto David in thy truth? Remember, Lord, the reproach of thy servants. How do I bear in my bosom the reproach of all the mighty people? Wherewith thine enemies have reproached, O oh, Lord, wherewith have they reproached the footsteps of thine anointed? And then he says this, Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. Now, if you've ever heard the heart cry of a people that don't understand what's going on, you're reading it right there. That psalm was written after David was dead. That psalm was not written by David. That psalm was written, and there's a little bit of question about it, but it's thought to be written in the captivity when they were in bondage. And what the psalmist writer was writing was this. He's taking God back to 2 Samuel chapter 7 and says, God, you made some promises to David back there, and I'm going to list them out for you. And he did. And I'm going to preach here in just a minute on the five aspects of the Davidic covenant and how it applies to your life as a Christian. But they're saying this. They're saying, but Lord... You told us if we sinned, if we committed iniquity, that you would chasten us. But you said you'd never let us go. You'd never, your, your love and kindness would never leave us. But Lord, and he gets into verse 38 and 39. You know what he says? He says what he's seeing. He says, you've made, va- he made void your covenant. Lord, he's saying you haven't stood by your word. Lord, you haven't done what you said you would do. Have you ever felt that way? Down in the deep desert, you don't have to raise your hand, nod your head, but have you ever said, Lord, what about this? This doesn't seem to be happening. Lord, have you, have you lied? Is your word true? Can I trust your word? Do you really mean what you say? Looking at the Davidic covenant here this morning, there's at least eight biblical covenants. In the covenants, there's two types. There's conditional and there's unconditional. Some of them have signs. I've preached on dispensations. The covenants run with dispensations. They start off in Eden, then Adam, and so forth. You have your Edenic covenant. You have your covenant God made with Adam. You have your covenant God made with Noah when he got off the ark. You have the covenant God made with Abraham in, in Genesis 12 and 15 there. Moses' covenant with the law. Then God made a land covenant where he covenanted to them that they would own the land forever. And then you have David's covenant, which is the seventh one. And it pertains to the throne of David. And then in the New Testament, it's also talked about in the Old Testament, but it's elaborated on the New Testament, the new covenant which God is going to make in the future with Israel when he'll put his laws within their hearts. Now, we need to rightly divide the word of truth. The church is not Israel, and Israel is not the church. But there are applications that God works with Israel that you can apply to the church, and that's what we want to get to this morning. Even though a covenant like this Davidic covenant has to do primarily with David and his descendants, there are implications for us because... All scripture is profitable, the Bible says. Jesus Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. You need to get that down. It's an interesting thing that in the New Testament, when Jesus Christ's lineage is given, it comes through Nathan, his son, who is named after Nathan the prophet, who God sent to tell David the covenant. It did not come through Solomon. Now, there's something there about that, because here's what happened. As you well know, the Israeli people, after David was king, his son Solomon reigned, right? But Solomon began to lead the nation away from God. Then Rehoboam comes up, and Jeroboam, and they split the nation of Israel into ten tribes and two tribes, ten northern tribes, two southern tribes. From that point on, all the way through the book of First and Second Kings, the nation deteriorates, 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 until the point that there were sodomite houses by the temple of the Lord. They were offering their children as sacrifices in fire. They had been totally swung into the Baalistic, paganistic, heathenistic practices. They worshiped in the groves. They were a nation that totally abandoned the word of God. And God sent them into captivity. I want to tell you a statement this morning. Guess who the worst enemy America has today is? The Lord. 
The worst enemy this nation has today is God Almighty. Because God decreed that nations that depart from him, he will judge. God told Israel what he would do with them if they departed from him. And they did it. And God sent them into captivity. Now, so here's what I want to get to you. Let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 7. We're going to look at these, these issues. These, there's five aspects to this. Now, this is going to encourage you today, okay? Don't get down. Get encouraged. Because when I read this and got studying this good, I jumped, I shouted, I said, glory to God Almighty. And I was excited. As I said, my body's tired, but my spirit's excited. We're going to be looking at this Davidic covenant. Now, keep in mind that David is one of the great forerunners of Jesus Christ. And the ultimate fulfillment of this Davidic covenant is Jesus Christ at the throne in heaven in eternity. But the Davidic covenant is linked to the earthly throne of David, his father David. Let me give you something. And I don't have time to go into all this today. But the prophets prophesy that David, who will be resurrected with us. You ever think about that? At the resurrection, David will be resurrected. Did you know in the millennial reign that David is going to sit on the throne of his throne in Jerusalem during the millennial reign? That's a Bible fact. You can find it in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, okay? David is going to sit on That's going to literally happen. Now, God doesn't play games and he doesn't play somatics. And when he says something, he means it. God told these people, he said, this covenant is forever. But look, at, I want you to think with me just a minute and then we're going to hit it. Did you know that for 2,430 some years right now, as best we can tell historically, there has not been a seat of David on a throne of David in Israel for 2,430 some years today. And when you look at the Jewish people and you look at them today across the world, and most of them are atheists and most of them are agnostic and they just don't have any time for Jesus Christ. Do you know what they think? And it's part of God. He said he's blinded them so that you and I can be brought in. But you know what they think? God lies. The Bible, not true. He promised that they would be a descendant, a seed of David, set on the throne of David forever. It's been 2,400 and some years. Hey, God, where are you at? And a lot of Jewish people just totally gave up. And they just said, you know, we don't even believe in the God of our ancestors anymore. And, this, and I want you Gentiles to listen to this preacher this morning because this will help you when you go through some things in life. Let's look at the aspects. There's five aspects. We're going to look at them here and then we're going to take off. There's parallels. Here's the deal. Now, I want you to be keeping in mind all the time. There are parallels between David's covenant that God made with him and the covenant testament that God made with you when he saved you. There are parallels going to run right down the deal together. God wants to teach you something. He said this stuff was written in the Old Testament, was written for our learning that we might have hope. And God's going to give you hope through this. All right. We're going to look at something. Number one out of the five aspects, and by the way, five is the number of grace. I know there's some debate about that, but five, but five, you mark it down. It's associated with grace all the way through the Bible. God's covenants are based upon his grace. They're based upon his mercy. They're based upon his loving kindness, not on our performance. Now look in verse, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, let's begin verse number 13. The first thing is that God said, David, in this covenant, he said, I'm going to, he shall build a house. God said he would build a house. That means that it was considered, it was centered around his family, his posterity, his seed, the house of David, David's descendants. Everybody got that? Say amen. amen. All right. Number two, in verse 13, you'll find out that he said, he said the throne, this covenant has a throne. It not only has a house, but it has a throne. It not only has a family, but it has a throne. Okay. Okay. And, and uh, in fact, if you want to read about this, if you want to write this down, Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6, Ezekiel 34, 23 through 34, 24, Ezekiel 37, verse 34. And what he's talking here about is that there will be a millennial earthly throne of David in Jerusalem that David himself will sit on as a, as it were, kind of, as a prince, a vice prince of Jesus Christ. I want to get this to you. What did they say whenever the angel announced Jesus' birth? In Luke chapter 1, turn your Bible, just get, I want you to get this. And I, I can't turn to all these things for time's sake today, but I hope that you'll get the message. Look at, but Luke chapter 1, when he's announcing the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 1, if I can get there, I'm slow this morning. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse number 31. Luke 1, 31, here's what the Bible said. The angel said unto her, fear not Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Now watch it. 
He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God, watch this, shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob. How long? Forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. I want to ask you a question. Did that happen when Jesus Christ came, when he was born, first, when his first coming? Did it happen? It didn't ha- he didn't sit on the throne of David. He's not ruling over there in Jerusalem today. What was, the an- what was the angel referring to when he announced this birth and announced this Jesus who would sit on the throne of his father and who would rule and reign? He was referring back to 2 Samuel chapter 7 and to Psalms chapter 89. Okay? Now, in Acts chapter 2 and Acts 15... Did you know what the Bible says? The apostles were preaching the gospel and they preached the fact that Jesus Christ would sit upon the throne of his father David and Jesus had already ascended back to heaven. Mm. But twice in the Acts, they preached that. Isaiah said that, that the government would be upon his shoulders. Talks about a throne in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. In Psalm 22, 122, verse number 5, the throne of the house of David. And as I said, David will be, according to Jeremiah, according to Ezekiel, David will be resurrected at the resurrection. And we're going to live through the millennial reign in our glorified bodies. And David will sit upon the throne of, uh, 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 of David there. Now, let me say something to you. Not a throne in heaven. That throne belongs to God the Father and Jesus Christ. This is an earthly throne of David. Number three, so we've got a family, we've got a throne. Number three, in verse number 12 and 13 of 2 Samuel 7, you're going to find the word kingdom. The last word in verse 12 is, I will establish his kingdom. Verse 13, I'll build a house for my name, establish a throne of his kingdom forever. Notice that, forever. Now, a king, a kingdom has a king. It has subjects. It has a sphere of rule. And uh, by the way, during the millennial reign, there will be a, an entire, they, David, as a vice president of Jesus Christ, will rule the whole earth. That'll be the thing. And by the way, a lot of your Old Testament prophets, that's why I'd like for you to read from Isaiah to Malachi, because they speak of this kingdom that is coming that, I, that 2 Samuel talks about in, in, in Psalms 89. So we've got a house, we've got a throne, we've got a kingdom. Number four, if you look at verse 13 with me, there's a duration of the covenant. A duration of the covenant. He said, he shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? Forever. So you've got a house. You've got a throne. You've got a kingdom. You've got a duration. But friends, there is a condition in this covenant. And you'll find that condition in verse number 14 and 15. Look at verse 14. I will be his father. He shall be my son. I'm going to ask you a question. How many here has got a daddy? (laughs) Those of you who don't, you're in trouble. All right. How long is it going to be your daddy? How long will you be a son? Forever. And ain't no idiot in the world can change that. Okay? By the way, in a, in a sense, your birth and your family was a covenant. It was. He said, forever. If you look in verse number 15, in verse 14, I will be his son, so he will be my son, if he commit iniquity. I will chasten him with the rod of men. In other words, he said, I will use men to chastise him with and the stripes of the children of men. But watch verse 15. He said, but my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took away from Saul, whom I put away from before thee. And then it goes ahead in verse 16 and says twice more that this covenant would be forever. So what do we got now? We, I want you to go back to Psalms chapter 89 for just a minute. You can go back there while I'm preaching you for just a second. But what have we got here? We have five aspects of the covenant of David, and here they are. He said it's going to be based on a house. He said it's going to have a throne. It's going to have a kingdom. It's going to have a duration forever, and it's going to have a condition. And this condition was this, and I want you to get this really, really tight. He said if you commit iniquity, he said I'm going to chastise you, and it's not going to be pretty. And they did do that, and God did chastise them. In fact, they're still under chastisement. They're still without the throne. They're still without the kingdom. They're still without the king. They're still without all the first four aspects of that covenant. They're not experiencing it. But here's the secret. God did not abdicate or or void that covenant like they felt like he had in Psalms 89. 
Because the Bible is very clear and Luke chapter 1 is very clear and Acts 15 is very clear that men of God who believe the Bible, they know that he is still coming back, that he is still going to rule and reign, that he is going to fulfill what he said he would do, even though they're experiencing the chastisement in the the meantime. So you say, Reggie, what are you getting to here? When you get into Psalms 89 and they start saying, Lord, verse number 39, thou hast made void the covenant of thy, here's what you get into. Did God break his word to them? Let me give you an illustration. This is why a lot of America is, is uh, based, has got this uh, replacement theology. Israel was not reborn until 1948. That's just been actually in my, you know, just a little bit before I was born. For 2,000 years and even before that, people said, ah, oh, the Bible ain't true. And here's what the people said, well, now wait a minute, you can't say, you can't say the Bible's not true, but a lot of stuff God said was going to happen ain't happened. And it can't happen. In their eyes. So what they do? They allegorize the Bible. Now you need to be listening tight right here because you're going to deal, especially you young people. They allegorize the Bible. They flipped over and made the church Israel and they said those are just kind of nice pie in the sky stuff that God wanted to say. And we can take stuff out of a thing we want and if we don't want it, we don't have to take it. But it really doesn't, God didn't, in other words, they're trying to save God from looking like a liar. Don't ever do that. God doesn't need you or me to make him not look like a liar. But they were looking and said, well, wait a minute. Because at 1900, back in the year 1900, you couldn't hardly find a premillennial, pre-tribulational rapture preacher in this country. And you know why? Because the Jews were still scattered all over the world. They did not have a homeland. They sure didn't have a throne. They sure didn't have a kingdom. They sure didn't have a king. It looked like everything God had written to them in the Old Testament went out into the universe so they start allegorizing now we've got replacement theology and all kinds of other junk we got they got something new coming up every week in this country now i mean i, I just got a deal yesterday it just makes me tired why don't we just read the bible and believe the bible okay but here's, here's here's what's going on now here's what's very important in psalms 89 they were in captivity they felt like god had, had voided his promises god had broken his covenant everything they were experiencing that they could see with their eyes, materially, really said, we've been thrown away by God. We are lost. We have lost God's covenant. Now let me tell you where that leads you. It leads you to cease believing in God. Because if God lies to you, and God can't be trusted, and God's word's not true, you know what you'll eventually do? You'll eventually just kind of ease back, and you won't tell anybody, you won't verbalize it, but down in your heart, you'll even go to church. You could even sing, I'll fly away. But down in your heart, you wonder, well, when I die, what's going to happen? Am I just going to go back to the dust? Because, I mean, there's just a lot of things hadn't really happened like I thought they were supposed to according to the word of God. And I heard the preacher preach this, and I heard the preacher preach that. And it ain't turned out that way. And that's what happened to the Jewish people. That's why you have so many Jewish atheists across the world who hate Christianity, who hate the Bible, don't like our Constitution. I'm just honest with you. And I love the Jewish people. I'm not trying to knock them. I'm telling you that they look at this and they say, hey, oh, yeah, really? David's covenant with us? God's word to us? We've been 2,430 years, and it ain't happened yet, bud. We don't see it. God said it. Now, either he's God or he's a liar. And if he's lying, we're not worshiping him. And that's where it heads to. They had felt that they had been lost, separated, forgotten from God, that God had broken his word. But I want to ask you a question. Has God broken his word? No, entirely. In fact, it's just the opposite. He did exactly what he said he would do. He said, if you commit iniquity and you commit sin, he said, I will chastise you. I will scatter you across the face. You read the rest of the prophecies about it. I'll scatter you into every nation in the world. You'll be buried in the nations of the world. You only, I mean, I mean I'm talking about punishment. And he said, and by the way, what they tell Jesus Christ when he's crucified, he said, his blood be upon us and our children. Oh, really? Hey, have you ever heard of the Holocaust? You heard about six million Jews being burned in the ovens? If you ever want to see something, go to the museum, the Holocaust Museum, and see what they did to a million babies, a million young Jewish kids. Shave their heads off. The old men, they, 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 poured them and they poured them in the shower, and then they go down there with their pliers and pull their gold fillings out, shave the hair off of them, skin their hides, make lampshades out of them. 
When the, when the German armies went into the Ukraine over there, folks, they went into whole Jewish villages, you know, bring them out there, line, line the men all up on the, on, on, by dozer-filled trenches, mow them down, walk up there and, and, and put a bullet in the back of their head, then rape their children and torment, rape their wives and torment their children. And I'm going to tell you something. From the time that God, the, the Israeli people turned to God and said, we don't want you, we don't want your statutes, your judgments, your commandments, I want to tell you, God said, listen, I told you, if you turn away from me, because they were to be the light to the nations. He put them at the bridge of the nations where every continent was going through that land. They were to be an example to people and tell people about the living God. And they turned their back and they burnt their own children in the fire. And they sacrificed to false gods. And God said, you do that, I'm going to whip the fire out of you. We think God's kidding when he tells us he's going to chasten us. We like the good parts, but we forget that God is holy and he don't lie to nobody. God said that be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. You cannot sow sin without reaping it manifold over time. You cannot mess with it. The wages of sin is death. God's told us, he said, I'll chastise you. Now, you say, Reggie, what are you getting to? Israel, I wish that they could believe the Bible, but let me just tell you, a thousand times no, God has not broken his covenant with Israel. He has kept it. And he will fulfill it in the Lord Jesus Christ in due time. Now, here's my message to you. We as believers, if we're born again, blood-bought, redeemed, covenant children of God, if we've genuinely been saved, now I'm talking about born again, we have a testament, we have a covenant with God. God has made a covenant with us. It's his salvation. The God of my salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. It's not of you and I. God is the one who sent Nathan to David to make that covenant. God is the one who set the terms of it. God who's the one who set the, uh, the, 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 the terms of that, of that covenant. And God is the one who sets the terms of our covenant with him. Now we have a covenant. Our covenant of salvation was ratified by and with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, and his shed blood sprinkled on the true mercy seat in the, on the throne in heaven. Our salvation's covenant is based upon the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is based upon his blood. It's based upon his death. It's based upon his oath. It's based upon his covenant. It's based upon his mercy. It's based upon his faithfulness. It's based upon his holiness. It's based upon his righteousness. It's based upon his sacrifice. It's based upon his resurrection. And it is based upon his word. Because you and I were not there at the cross. Now you say, Reggie, what are the elements of our covenant? Now we're going to move right now totally away from David's covenant. Only except to say, you and I have a covenant. And it has five aspects to it. Just like David's did. And here they are. Did David have a house? Yes, he did. The house of David, the Bible talks about it. It was his lineage, his seed, okay? The church, believers, saints, do we have a house? Yes. 1 Timothy 3.15 says we are the house of God. In Hebrews 3.6, the Bible says whose house we are. In 1 Peter 2.5, it says that we're a spiritual house. The Bible said in 1 Peter 4.17, that judgment must begin at the house of God. So does our covenant have a house? Yes, it has a house. God is our father. We're brothers and sisters. We're a family of God. Amen. Amen. All right. So when, number one, David's covenant had a house. Our covenant has a house. Number two, did David's covenant have a kingdom? Yes, it did. Does our covenant have a kingdom? Yes, it does. What's Jesus Christ with Nicodemus? Except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom. Enter into the kingdom. You say, Reggie, what is the kingdom? There is a kingdom in mystery form, Matthew chapter 13. And you and I, when we're saved, we are made part of, as members of that family, we are made priests and kings unto God. We're part of that kingdom. David's covenant had a kingdom. You and I have a kingdom. By the way, we not only have a kingdom in mystery as it is right now, but we will also be in the kingdom of the millennial reign kingdom and in the eternal kingdom past the great white throne judgment. So we have the house and we have the kingdom and we have thirdly a throne. Did you know the Bible said, let us come boldly to the throne of grace 
that we may obtain mercy and help in time of need. You and I have not only a house, the church, the body of believers, the family of God. We have a kingdom, the kingdom of, of heaven. We have a throne, the throne of grace that you and I can approach to. And I'm going to give you something else. I'm not going to go to the Bible and read it today, but you know the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21 that we will sit with him in his throne. Yeah. Woo! Amen. You know what? How many like to be a little happier? Think about eternal things and quit thinking about all the junk you're around. Did you know the Bible says that we shall reign with him? That we will be seated. We are seated in heavenly places now in Christ Jesus. Did you know the Bible teaches that we're heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ? That we are going to literally reign with him during the millennial reign. And we're going to reign with him. Hey, how many knows that a queen reigns with the king? And the church is the queen. And Jesus is the king. And the Bible said that we're going to rule and reign with him forever. Amen. Uh, David had a house. We have a house. David had a kingdom. We've got a kingdom. David had a throne. We've got a throne. Amen. By the way, I'll just give you the, the, the re references on that. Roman, Revelation 1, 5 and 6. Revelation 20, verse 6. Revelation 22, 5. Revelation 3, 21. Revelation 5, 10. Re 2 Timothy 2, 12 says, If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. God made a covenant with you. That's part of your covenant. You see, God's a lot more than just saving your hide from hell. He wants to bring you into his glory and his, in his, his life. Now, the third thing. Now, if you don't get happy here, there's nothing I can do for you. What was the, I'm sorry, the fourth thing. Remember, there's a house, there's a kingdom, there's a throne. And then there was a duration. How long, <laughs> how long, how long was David's kingdom going to last? According to the Bible. Forever. Guess how many times it says forever in your text? Three times. That's a divine decree. Forever. But wait a minute. It's been 2,430 some years since there's been a seed of David on a throne of David in the city of Jerusalem. Don't make any difference. Don't make any difference. God will fulfill and do what he said he would do. Now here's the beautiful part. So that tells you this. If you've got a covenant, if you're saved today and you have a covenant, by the way, this is, if you're not saved here today, I'm going to tell you something about the Bible salvation, okay? I don't buy into Bible salvation that you got it today and lose it tomorrow. And if you believe that, there's only one thing I want you to do. I want you to list to me verses, scripture, and the, don't give me no nonsense and no religious bull. I want to know the verse and passage of scripture of what sin it is and how many sins you've got to do to lose your salvation. I want to know. And don't give me your, don't give me your stuff. You give me what sins and how many sins it is. Can I tell you something? If you ever get saved, God will save you forever. If God gives you a covenant, it's a forever covenant. What did he say in John chapter 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed, that's a covenant, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, got it now, everlasting life. John three thirty six. John 10, 28, John 5, 24, John 6, 37. Eternal, eternal, everlasting, everlasting. But Christians don't believe it. Mm. Hey, I'm going to tell you this. You see, here's the deal. Now, wait, hang on to you a little bit. You know what it says in Hebrews? It calls our redemption eternal redemption. It calls our salvation in Hebrews 5, 9, eternal salvation. I am telling you this morning. I told you, I, I've put on Facebook, this is shouting ground. Because I'm going to tell you something right now. This world and the religion of this world, they hate this. They hate this with a passion. You know why they hate it? Because they can't control you. Wow. They can't control you. Oh, you sucked cigarettes last week, did you? So you lost your salvation. Oh, you had a bad thought. You lose your salvation. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me what the covenant of God, where the covenant of God says that you doing something loses, makes God's word void, null and void. You bunch of Presbyterians. <laughs> you ought to say, bless God Almighty, or peep like a mouse, amen, or do something. I want to tell you something. If you're not saved by God's covenant, by His word, if you're not kept by His power, you're not kept. If you're lost, you just well go to hell. And by the way, any preacher listening to me and any religion listening to me, hey, tell me about the Mormons. Yeah, if you don't live up to their deal, you're going to go to hell. You're going to lose it pretty soon. Tell me about the Jehovah Witnesses. Tell me about the Catholics. Tell me about half the Baptists. Tell me about the Pentecostals. Tell me. Their covenant is not a covenant like that covenant. Woo! 
You know why I like preaching on it? Because the devil don't like it. It makes the devil matter and a hornet when you preach on the covenant that here's the whole deal. Our God does not lie. Amen. He doesn't lie. But here's the catch. What's the fifth aspect? But if you commit iniquity, I'll chastise you. What's the fifth aspect of your salvation covenant? <laughs> You sin, now you're sinning as a son or a daughter. You're not sinning as a lost sinner. You're sinning as a son. So what's the papa going to do? You know, I'll tell you how my daddy would do it. He'd grab you by the left arm, up you'd come, and around you'd go. We did the yaha hillbilly dance down to our farm. <laughs> how many ever done the yaha hillbilly dance with the left hand? You, you, know, you, had a, you had a dancing partner. It was your dad. Hey, if you are truly born again of God and you get out of the will of God and you sin and you won't confess it quick and repent of it, God's going to whoop the snot out of you. He'll whoop you. If ye be without chastisement, you're not sons but bastards. You're a fake, you're a phony, you're not a true child of God. He's not really your father. Woo! I like it, amen? Now here's what the deal is. Some of you are going to get out of the will of God. You say, Reggie, how do you know this? Had practice. <laughs> you're going to get out of the will of God and you're going to pull up like a toad frog. Say, it wasn't my fault. It was them other people's fault. I didn't do anything wrong. And you're going to justify and rationalize. You're getting backslidden, get out of the will of God and everything else. And I've done it and I know how to do it. I know how to look spiritual when I'm as sorry as dirt, brother. And you know what will happen to you? You're going to get farther and farther away from God. And, and by the way, when you sin and won't confess it, won't get right with God, he'll cut your fellowship off. He will not cut your relationship off. He cuts your fellowship off. Okay? And you're going to just drift off and you're going to drift off. You're going to be blaming everybody and his brother that's a problem with your life. And next thing you know, you're going to pray and your prayers don't get answered. Next thing you know, you're going to walk into church and you feel like you're in, in, in North Africa somewhere. Next thing you know, a song, blessed assurance don't mean anything to you. You almost hate to hear it. Next thing you know, you don't enjoy the fellowship of the saints. Next thing you know, you quit reading your Bible. Next thing you know, you're off in the left field out here. And you know what? Pretty soon you're going to look at them and say, I don't believe God about nothing. Where's God? You know, and then, you know what? God's going to send some, out, what I call outer chastisement to you. And the next thing you're going to, where's God when I need him? Where's God when I need him? God's going to say, I'm doing exactly what I told you I'd do. You sin and you don't get right me now, I'll chastise you. By the way, it didn't say some of God's children. It said all of them. It said, if ye be without chastisement, you are not sons. He said, he chasteneth every son whom he receiveth. You know what that tells me? That every son sins. How many here's been? How many here saved? I mean, you you've been born again, blood washed. You've been saved. Now I want to ask you a question: How many of you sinned in the last week? Hey, why don't those clowns who preach and lose your salvation all the time, who, as far as I'm concerned, blaspheme the covenant of God? Why don't they get up and just get honest and say, "Now wait, before we start church today, how many people have sinned this week? Raise your hand. Now let's get right and get saved again before we even start church." I mean, let's just get honest. Some of you folks listen online. You're, you're turned it off now on me. Yeah, I know. Some of you is reaching for the dial. But it's the truth, amen. If I'm saved by works of righteousness, which I've done, then what did Jesus shed his blood for? Hey, I can't keep myself. I'm kept by the power of God through faith. Hey, did you know what Philippians 1, 6 says? That he hath, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. You're not going to, you didn't start it. You ain't finishing it. Woo! He is the author and the finisher of eternal salvation. Now, some of you go sit back and say, bless God, I think I'll go out and sin then. Yeah, look out. First of all, if that's how you think, you ain't, I don't, don't think you know God. I just, I just don't think you know God. I just, I just can't imagine. I just, boy, I'm just, that ain't the way it works with me. I'm telling you what, Brother Bill, when I sin, Immediately, there's a conviction of the Holy Ghost that that ain't right, Reggie. I was pilling around yesterday morning, and I had some stupid stuff going through my mind, and it was not right. And the Holy Ghost said, Reggie, you better get off that track right now. You better get straightened up. Yeah. Amen. 
I want to tell you, my heavenly father's got a big old rod. He's got a switch, amen. And I'm telling you something, and, and, and I'm just saying this to you. You ought to just jump for joy. You ought to shout hallelujah that he don't cut you off and send you to hell. Because if I was God, I would. <laughs> I'm just that mean and ornery. But you know, God does, hey, see, that's where the Jehovah Witnesses get you. They'll come to your door and you'll say, well, I, would you send your kids to hell just because they do something wrong? And you'll say, well, no. Well, neither does our father send his children to hell just because they do something wrong. The problem is you ain't his child. And if you're not God's child, he will send you to hell. But if you're his child, here's what he said he'd do. He said, I'll chastise you. I'll whoop you. But he said, I ain't going to break my covenant. Let me just tell you, I'm sure that right here inside this church house, in fact, I know there is because I'm in here. There are people who could tell you honestly, I have gotten away from God for years at a time. And, and yet, the Father would come and tap on your shoulder. He'd chase you again. I, I want to tell you a little something the Bible teaches. That if you take communion and you're not willing to get right, that's part of the whole purpose of taking communion is to get you honest with God. And you won't do it. You want, how many knows what the Bible says will happen? Could happen to you. He'll kill you. Do you know what Paul said? He said, I delivered these two guys to Satan. God, but you know what? I'm, I'm, not, let me I'm, not, I'm not preaching easy believism. I'm not preaching any of that junk. I'm just telling you it's God's covenant. Now, either I'm a child of God or I'm not. And if I am, I'm part of that covenant. And part of that covenant is the condition deal that, Reggie, you sin, you're going to get chastised. I ain't letting you by with it. And Reggie, until you get right, and I'm going to tell you something. There are people out here, I'm sure, that we think are lost. They're not lost. They're just like Israel, 2,430 years out in the wilderness. There's some people we may think are saved. They ain't saved at all. Because they can just sin and sin and sin and no chastising ever comes to them. But I want to tell you right now, if you're saved, you'll get chastised. But here's the good part. Here's the shouting part. He ain't never going to cut you off. My mercy will not depart from you. How many besides this old preacher has gotten away from God? How many of you, you out there, you're trying to keep your mind off of it. You're trying not to think of it. But oh, the old prime preachers used to say, but those old bloodhounds from heaven to get on your trail. <laughs> and you'd, try, you'd listen to an old rock song. <laughs> that old hound from heaven. Saying, you don't belong in this mud hole. I bought you with the blood of my son. You know you're my child. Why don't you get out of the ditch and get back home? Amen. I want to encourage some of you today. I don't know. I'm not God. I can't see in a man's heart. But I can tell you this much. According to the Bible, if you get away from God, quote, and you're a Christian and you don't get chastised, you're not saved. If you can go on out there and sin and you don't get chastised, you're not saved. That's just the way it is. But I can promise you this, that if you're saved, God will chastise you. And his tender mercies will never depart from you. Wait a minute. You say, but Reggie, what if I never repent? His tender mercies still won't depart from you. Brother Dennis, I could get off. and I don't want to, but I could get in a bad way. Get totally out of the will of God. And Lonnie, maybe never repent the rest of my life. I'd suffer for it. But he's not going to take his mercy away from me. He's not going to avoid his covenant with me. You know why? Because he's a man of his word. He said, I said forever is forever. Can I tell you something? I think sooner than we think. There could be a throne set up in Jerusalem in the new temple. And the Lord come back. David resurrected with us. And I want to tell you something. You can see David in, in just a few years. You can see David sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. Only thing I can promise you, he's going to do what he said he would do with Israel. And if he doesn't, then how could I expect him to do what he says he'll do with me? Now, I'm going to, just want to tell you something. I didn't make this up. The Bible's the one that said this. Listen to it. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. That's what the Bible said. He that heareth my word, he said he's passed from death unto life and shall not come into condemnation. You see, there's a difference between being chastised 
and condemned with the world, the Bible said. One is a son. The other is an unsaved sinner, not a son. God deals with them totally different. If you're here today and you're doubting God, you're wondering, God, where are you at? I don't know about everything. I don't have no clue. The older I get, the dumber I am. But I'm still going to believe him. I'm still going to trust him. If he didn't save me and save me forever, like he said, Dean, I ain't got no hope. I'll just be honest with you. I'll be honest with all of you. If I didn't believe that book, I'd quit preaching today if I can't trust it. Because, Brother Cooper, I'll never live good enough to go to heaven. I'll go to heaven by the mercy of God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ or I ain't a going. I'll never be good enough. Amen. Now, I'm going to give you all a chance to shout. You all just go, go, go for it. Amen. All right. And go to, hey, you say, well, listen, I don't like that. Well, you wouldn't go like heaven because they shout in heaven. Amen. Amen. And I'll tell you something. These kids need to grow up in the church where mom and daddy was enthused about the word of God. God for the word of God. And had some happiness. Oh, I know you'll go to a ball game, sit on that stupid concrete bench for two hours, hoop and holler and have the best time in the world. Come to church on a padded, air-conditioned seat and sit there like, ah, oh, we're just going to get over anyway. <laughs> Did we get it? You got the covenant? You got a covenant. Now, I want you to remember this when everything's going south, when you prayed for your loved one to live and they died. When you prayed for God to give you a job and you lost the one you had. I want you to still say, God, I still trust you. I don't care what it looks like today. I'm going to tell you, Mom and Dad, as you claim your children for God, would you? I don't care what it looks like today. I'm going to claim my kids for God. You do that. Oh, my goodness, it's 12.02. Folks are going to beat us to the restaurants, aren't they? <laughs> now I'm going to talk to the church a little bit here. I'll be back tonight, and I want to tell you tonight, if God doesn't change my mind, I'm going to give you one of the sweetest messages you've ever heard in your life about peace. I'll tell you what I like to got blowed over. I found out why Reg Kelly at times does not have peace. Whew. It's powerful. I wanted to preach someone could. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. Next Sunday morning, and possibly the next Sunday morning, I'm going to be gone. I'm taking a trip. I'm going with my family, I'm going to go mountain. I'm just going to go take, I'm like all of you, I need to break every once in a while. And I'll come back so full of fire and I'll have 52 messages and try to preach them all on one Sunday, okay?